OK, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. So what I'm going to talk about is a joint work with uh, Voik and Yakshit from uh, McGill, Wagner, who is here from Versailles, and Claude Lampier from Marseille. Uh, well, the subject of this talk is closely related to the mini course given by Sergei Kuksin. So I will not uh, try to motivate the abstract form of the problem I'm going to discuss, but we will do consider some examples uh, later. So I will start directly from the setting of the problem in an abstract form. And I will try also to use the notation used in the mini course. Uh, so we consider two Hilbert spaces, H and E. So these are separable Hilbert spaces. And I consider a continuous operator acting from a direct product into H. And finally, I will also need two subsets, one of them in H and the other, K, in E. And I will assume that these are closed subsets for the moment. So we consider the following random dynamical system with a phase space H. So we have the relation UK equal to S of UK minus 1 E to K, or K greater than 1, or equal to 1. And the initial condition U0 at time 0. So here, e to k is a sequence of iid random variables. And we assume that they take values in the space, uh, in the set k. Uh, I forgot to mention here the condition of the subsets. So I will assume that the subsets are such that s of x times k is included in x. So this is an invariant subset, which means that if my random variable e to k is in k, for any initial condition which is in x, I will always remain in the set x. So e to k is a iid in, uh, with range in k. Uh, and due to this condition, equations 1, 2 generates random uh, Markov process in X. Well, the goal is to study the large time behavior of trajectories of this Markov process. But very often, it is not the Markov process which we want to observe but a functional of the Markov process, an observable. So we'll fix f, which is a function from x to r, or can be also rd. And instead of the process uk itself, we consider the values of this f on the process uk. And we want to study the lifetime behavior of f of uk. Or, very often, uh, you deal with not the, this sequence it, uh, 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 itself, but you consider time average. So I will denote psi n of f, the time average of this sequence, because when you consider this sequence, you cannot say much. So you, take, you should take either the time average with respect to ensemble, or the, uh, sorry, the average with respect to ensemble, or the time average. So let's take the time average, which is 1 over n, the sum k from 0 to n minus 1 f of uk. So now the question is to study the large time behavior of psi n of f. Now there are at least three groups of results concerning psi n f, or concerning f u of uk. So the first one is law of large numbers, or strong law of large numbers even. 
It is about the existence of this limit when n goes to infinity. There is also what is called central limit theorem. It's essentially about the rate of convergence or uh, after appropriate normalization, uh, the, the, uh, it's about uh, the, the limiting uh, measure. And also the large deviation principle. And as the title suggests, I will discuss in this talk the large deviation principle. Just to mention briefly that uh, this property, uh, together with some additional hypothesis, always implies central limit theorem and central uh, strong law of large numbers. So in a sense, this is a finer property than uh, the first two of them. And uh, a price to pay is that usually it holds under some additional conditions. Uh, so let me uh, begin with the definition of large deviation principle. So there are, uh, I will discuss in this talk two levels of large deviations. So let's begin with level one LDP. So we say that uh, one satisfies level one LDP, or I will sometimes say just one LDP, if there is a function from R to zero plus infinity, the plus infinity is not excluded, such that you have the following properties. First of all, if you consider the level sets or sublevel sets, this should be compact subset of R. This is true for any C. And in addition, you have the following complicated inequalities. I take any Borel subset of R. And for any Borel subset of R, I should have the following. If I take the lower limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n logarith p u, this u means that I consider trajectory starting from the point u. It can be deterministic or it can be random, but it should take values in x. And I compute the probability that this time average of the observable f belongs to gamma, right? So this is always no greater than the upper limit when n goes to infinity of the same expression. For the moment, I didn't write anything. And uh, the meaningful part is the following. So this should be greater than minus lower bound of i of x when x belongs to the interior of gamma. And this should be smaller than minus lower bound of i of x when x belongs to the closure of gamma. So let me write here where gamma dot is the interior of gamma and gamma bar is the closure of gamma. Well, I didn't specify for the moment the class of functions I take. Well, you can think of continuous functions, bounded continuous functions, or just measurable functions, it depends. But when I talk about level one LDP, it means that I fix a function and my rate function, this is called rate function, will of course depends on uh, f. It will not be the same function for all of f. So there is a function if, which depends on f, which has compact level sets, and you have this rather complicated inequality. 
Well, if you are not familiar with this, this may indeed look complicated, but it is, in fact, the best you can hope for. So to see this, let us consider an example. Let us consider a trivial example when your face space is the same as the, your noise space and is equal to R. Then your map S is trivial. S of u eta is equal to eta. Uh, and your random variables, eta k, are normal random variables with mean 0 and variance sigma square. And finally, your initial condition is a random variable which is, has the same low and it's independent of eta k. Well, in other words, I just consider iid case. Right? So what I've written here is the iid case, and you take a trivial function f of x is equal to x. This is just to show that iid case is a particular case of this general random dynamical system. So in this case, everything can be computed. In this case, psi n of f, psi n of f, well, just the triviality, it will be just the sum of eta k k from 0 to n minus 1 eta k. And for this random variable, everything can be computed. The law of psi n, the law of the sum from 0 to n minus 1 eta k, well, we have independent random variables with normal lows. When you take the sum of independent random variables with normal low, you again obtain a normal random variable with variance n sigma squared. And then if you take, if you divide it by n, you get again normal random variable, but with variance divided by n squared. This should be divided by n squared, so you get sigma squared divided by n. So in other words, if you want to compute the probability of psi n being gamma, well, you have a density, you have explicit formula. You can write it explicitly. This will be square root of n divided by square root of 2 pi sigma. And then you need to take the integral over gamma of exponential minus, so this is the variance. You will have uh, x squared over 2 sigma squared multiplied by n dx. So everything can be computed explicitly. And you see that. If you want to study large time behavior, the structure of a gamma will play an important role. Because you have here exponentially decaying term. And of course, the maximal value of this one will determine the exponential decay. Right? So you need to take the maximum of this one, because this will be the most important one. So if we introduce the function i of x, which is just this factor, x squared, divided by 2 sigma squared, then everything will be determined more or less by the minimum of i on the set gamma, if gamma has a regular structure. However, let's consider the following two cases. So this is 0. Gamma is an interval here. Plus a point here. Then, of course, this point will not play any role. So if you want to have a lower bound, you need to consider only those points which are in the interior of gamma. On the other hand, if you want to consider the upper bound, and you have a complicated counterset of positive measure, or counterset minus something countable dense, then interior point will not be sufficient. You do need to consider the closure of gamma to get the right asymptotics. In any case, it is a simple exercise to prove that for this particular case, you do have this type of asymptotics. If you take the logarithm, and if you divide by n, then 
this will be described by I of gamma dot or gamma bar. Okay, so you have explicit formula. It is really easy to prove that you will have this, and you cannot do better. So this complicated inequality is somehow justified. So this is what is called level 1 LDP. Now, what about level 2 LDP? Uh, well, this is what is interesting for applications, but it turns out that in this form, it is more difficult to study. So the right way to proceed is to consider something more general, which is called level 2 LDP. Yeah, so what is level 2 LDP? Uh, let us consider the following sequence of random measures on x. So we have new n, and I write 1 over n, the sum k from 0 to n minus 1, and I take Dirac mass at the point uk. So uk is a random sequence. Dirac mass at the point uk is a random measure on x. So new n is a random measure, random probability measure, on x. And then definition, so for each omega, for each realization, this is a probability measure on x. So definition, we say that 1 satisfies 2 LDP or level 2 LDP if there is a function i which acts on the space of probability measures on x. So this is a probability measures on x. With range in 0 plus infinity. Infinity is not excluded. Such that, again, you have this compactness property. If you take the level set, then this should be a compact set in Px, and if since I'm talking about compactness, I need to specify the topology, so this will be always weak star topology. Right? So the weak star topology is defined by convergence on continuous bound, bounded continuous functions. So this should be compact for any C. And now for any Borel subset of the space of measures, because now we are working in the space of measures, you have this type of inequality. So let me write it again. So we have lim sup 1 over n p u. Let me remind you that u means that we start from point u. And here I'm writing new n, this random measure. So this for each omega, this is a measure. So I can consider probability that this belongs to gamma. And I forgot the logarithm here. So this is, again, smaller than lim soup as n goes to infinity of the same expression, 1 over n logarithm probability for the trajectory starting from u that nu n belongs to gamma. And the left and right and uh, le leftmost and rightmost term are exactly the same minus. So I will write, introduce a notation here, i of gamma bar and greater than minus i of gamma dot where i of something is the lower bound of i. Well, it's a lambda when lambda belongs to a, right? So this is exactly the same inequality, except that now we are writing in for the space of measures. So we have level 1 LDP. It is for functions. And we have level 2 LDP. It is for measures. So what is the relation between these two? The relation is very simple. 
it is given by the following proposition. If you have level 2 LDP, then you have level 1 LDP for any bounded continuous function on X. And let me outline the proof. So this is a well-known result, and it's called contraction principle. So let us, call, let us consider a function. Let us fix F, which is a bounded continuous function on X. So this is a case of bounded continuous function on X. And let us consider the following map from, it depends on F, and which goes to the space of measures into R. And it takes any measure lambda to the mean value of F with respect to lambda. So this is bracket mean the integral of F with respect to lambda. Then, it is straightforward to check that if you take psi n of f, then it is exactly the mean value of f with respect to new n. Or, in other words, psi n of f is the image of this sequence new n under the map phi f. And this is a continuous map. Uh, sorry, this is not what I want to say. Now, if you have this, you have also similar relation for the lows, the low of psi and f, because large deviation is about the lows, right? We are considering the low of this random variable. So the low of psi and f can be expressed in terms of low of new n. Now, low of new n is a probability measure on this space. So this is a probability measure on the space of measures. And I need to consider the image of this low under this mapping phi f. So you have this relation. And there is, uh, and now this application, which sends the lows on px on the lows of r by this formula with respect to phi f is continuous. And there is what is called contraction principle It has nothing to do with the Banach contraction principle about fixed point. And it says that if you have LDP for new n, LDP for new n, this is exactly level 2 LDP, then due to continuity of phi f, it should be continuous, then you will have LDP for psi and f for any f which is bounded and continuous. So this is really direct application of what is called contraction principle. And you can find contraction principle in any book on LDPs. This is one of first results. This is a really soft result. In addition, you can write, so let me write here, the explicit form of the rate function. Rate function for one LDP. So i f of x is the infimum of i of lambda. So i f of x is the rate function for 1 LDP. i of lambda is the rate function for 2 LDP. Then you should take all the measures such that f integrated with respect to lambda gives you this value x. OK, so this is really a soft result, which shows that level 2 LDP implies level 1 LDP. So from now on, I, will, I am going to consider only level 1 LDP. OK, so let me summarize what we have done, because I'm going to raise something. So we are studying this random dynamical system. So let me write this system here. UK is S of U K minus 1 eta K. So this is system one. Two, this is the initial condition. Sorry. This is the initial condition. We have e to k is an IID 
in x. Uh, and this uh, x, uh, oh no, so is e iid in e, and I consider my system uk in x, and this hypothesis ensures that we do have a well-defined system in x. Okay, so this was the first section. Now, now the second part is the main result. Well, from now on, uh, until almost the end, I will assume that x and e are, no, x and k are compact subsets of h and e. So I consider the compact setting. This is not very restrictive if we are dealing with PDEs, with bounded noise. And I will need some hypotheses which are very similar to those discussed by Sergei Kuksin. So the first hypothesis is just regularity condition for S. So I call it regularity. OK, so let me emphasize the hypothesis so we can see them easily. Regularity. It says that there is a vector space compactly embedded in H such that S, which acts, S acts from H times E to V and is C2 bounded, but uh, C2 bounded means in this context that it is bounded on bounded subsets, right? So we have a map which is twice continuously differentiable, and I assume that the map itself and its derivative up to order two are bounded on bounded subsets. So C2 bounded means by definition that uh, twice differentiable. Ah, okay. Right, okay, so then uh, C2 bounded is just uh, shortened for saying continuously differentiable, twice continuously differentiable, bounded on bounded subsets. Okay, so this is the regularity condition. Now, the second condition is about global controllability. So let's say GC. Okay, so there is no big difference between white and rose. So global controllability, it says that for any epsilon, there is an integer m such that for any initial point u0 and final point u hat, I can find eta1, eta m in k such that the distance between the trajectory starting from u0 and driven by this control, theta1, theta km, is in epsilon neighborhood of my target u hat. Right, so we, uh, so sm of u is the trajectory of this one at time k. Right, so uh, u, in other words, S M of u is u m when you use controls eta one eta m. Okay, so this is the trajectory of of one, two. 
read u equal to u naught. So this is the usual concept of global approximate controllability in X. We start from any point. We want to go to the epsilon neighborhood of pi target. And the property is that it should be uniform with respect to the size of the ball, uh, sorry, with respect to the initial and final point. But it, of course, it can increase when I decrease the size of the ball. So I fix the size. Then there is a universal integer such that this is true. Now, third condition, controllability of linearization. This is exactly the same condition as before. Well, if you want, I will use B. 3 prime in Sergei Kuksin's talk. And it says that for any u in x, for any eta in k, the image of the derivative d eta s u eta, so I differentiated s with respect to eta. This means that this is a map, linear, linear application from e to h. This should be dense. OK, so three hypotheses. Regularity hypothesis, it is C2 with a, a smaller space, compactly embedded in h. Global controllability, I can go from any point to any other point uniformly with respect to the initial and final points. And controllability of the linearized map, which says that the derivative of S has a dense image. So these are conditions on S. And we need also condition on eta, on the law of eta. And I call it decomposability. And it says that uh, there is an orthonormal basis in E such that uh, two properties. First, low of eta. So I'm taking the lows of these IID random variables, can be written as a tensor product of its one dimensional projections onto the straight lines spanned by EJ. Right, so I will write and we'll make some comments. So LJ is the image of L. on the one-dimensional projection. So P, sorry, let me write here PJ. So we have orthogonal basis, EJ. We have orthogonal projection, PJ, on the straight line spent by EJ. So PJ is a one-dimensional projection. So for each measure, I consider, for this measure L, I consider all its one-dimensional projections. And the condition is that L should be tensor product of these measures. Or if you want this in terms of the random variables e to k, it means that it, e to k can be written as the sum j from 1 to infinity of, uh, well, it can always be written like that this way, e to k j e j. Well, I just decomposed e to k in the orthogonal basis. The condition that these random variables should be independent. So this is a rewriting of this decomposability condition. So L is a tensor product of its one-dimensional projections. And in addition, I assume that these one-dimensional projections possess uh, C1 smooth densities. So this is true. And Lj 
of dr is equal to rho j of r dr and rho j is a c1 function on r and of course it's also has compact support because I assume that this is compact so in particular each projection has a compact support so four conditions regularity global controllability controllability of linearization in the sense that the image is dense and decomposability of these IID random variables then you have the following result Okay, main theorem. Well, it has two parts. The first part is very easy to formulate. If you have R regularity, global controllability, controllability of linearization, and decomposability then you have two L D P for one. Okay, this is really theorem, you don't think anything else. Second property about the rate function. The rate function which enters this inequality, the, which determines the large time asymptotics of these probabilities. So the rate function has the form, the rate function is a function on the space of measures, so I of lambda is equal to, you need to take the supremum over all continuous functions, which are, let's say, greater than one, of the following integral, integral over x, and you need to take here logarithm g divided by p1 of g, I will write in a second what this p1 is, d lambda, this is in fact a Markov semigroup, a time one, where, well, lambda is an arbitrary measure, probability measure nx, and p1 of g, this is a function, for instance, I can write this way, p1 uh, uh, of g at the point v is the mean value of g calculated on s p e to one. Or in other words, this is just Markov semigroup at time one associated with this process. Okay, so this is the main result. Uh, so let us compare what uh, with the results uh, in the mini course. Yeah. Well, it is, it is hidden here. So I believe, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if you assume this B3 prime, which is a stronger condition than B3, then you don't need global fixed point, globally stable fixed point. So I did, did assume B3 prime, so I don't need globally stable fixed point. What is sufficient, what would be sufficient for Sergey? It would be just there is one point to which you can drive all your trajectories. Here, I need something more. I need really irreducibility from any point to any other point. Okay? And this will be one of the open problems I'm planning to give at the end. Okay, so this is the main theorem. Uh, so the next point is the applications, but before doing that, let me mention some references. In fact, Well, the, the whole story about uh, large deviations for stochastic equations started by, uh, in the 70s, uh, uh, by Donsker and Varadan. They've written a series of four, four papers covering a lot of stuff. 
then there was an entire series of uh, papers about improving this result, proving it for more complicated equations, and so on. So I, there's no way I can mention any of them. In the context of PDEs, there was a result in 2006 by uh, Li Ming Wu and uh, Gursi. Matteo Gursi, is the, he was a student of Li Ming Wu. They, they studied uh, Navier-Stokes equation or Berger's equation perturbed by rough noise. And if we translate into this language, their condition, their condition is that here, sorry, here, the image of the derivative is not simply dense, but it is equal to H. So this is the difference between this result and what was done by Gursi and Li Ming Wu. And what I'm talking about is our two papers. One of them is published, the other is not. Well, in fact, there was another one uh, for unbounded noise with, uh, with my co-authors, uh, Jakšić, uh, Nersesian, Pia, and myself. So this is, this is the way it is written in the recent paper of 2019. Okay, I think I have some 15, 16 minutes left, so let us discuss. Yeah, so let us discuss the application of this result, and I will conclude by formulating three open questions in this subject. So application. Well, in fact, this was more or less done by Sergei Kuksin, so let me do it briefly. So we can apply this result to, roughly speaking, any reasonable parabolic PDE. So let me consider two examples. Navia stocks in 2D. So I consider Navier stokes in a bounded domain, a compact domain in 2D. So let me remind the, the form of Navier stokes DTU plus U nab by U. Well, of course, this is just scalar product in R2 minus nu delta U. Nu is a, well, let me raise nu, that doesn't play any role. Plus nabla P is equal to eta of Tx. Divergence of u is equal to zero, and everything happens in a bounded domain D. Uh, well, and we impose directly boundary condition. So u on the boundary is equal to zero, and some initial condition u of zero x is equal to u zero of x. Well, I will specify in a second what is the exact form of eta, but it's exactly the same as in the mini course. Or you can deal with complex Gimbal Landau equation. Again, in a bounded domain, but now we consider it in dimension three. And it has the following form DTU minus delta U plus uh, uh, I u to 2p u, again, equal to a function eta of tx. Again, I impose directly boundary condition. u on the boundary is equal to 0, and some initial condition. u0x is equal to u0 of x. And here, p is a number. Well, p equals 0 is trivial, but we can do p equal to 1 and 2 in dimension 3. Uh, so these are two examples for which uh, you can apply this theory.
Now, let me specify the form of the random force. It is exactly as before. So you have a sum k from 1 to infinity. You have indicator function of the interval k minus 1 k. And then you multiply it by independent random variables e to k. So let me first write t minus k plus 1 x. So e to k is an IID in L2 on the interval 0, 1 times d with range in R2. Right? So I divide my interval, time interval, time uh, axis into pieces of length 1. And here I act with the force eta 1, here with the force eta 2, eta 3, and so on. Then, if I'm interested in the dynamics of my system at integer, integer times, so if I denote by uk the solution at time k, then obviously to calculate solution at time k, I can apply the time 1 resolving operator for Navier-Stokes. Uh, no, for Navier Stokes. And I need to apply to this value solution time k minus 1 and to the noise which acts on the interval k minus 1 k. So we have exactly the system of that type. So to check that we have large deviation principle on level 2 for Navier Stokes, we need to verify these four conditions. Well, Regularity condition is nothing, because this is always true for PDEs in sufficiently smooth functional spaces. Well, controllability is something. I'll discuss it in a second. Controllability of linearization in this setting, it is trivial. Because I assume that my space E is, uh, well, sorry, I didn't assume anything for the moment. But I will assume that E to K of Tx has the following form. It is basically what was written there. J from 1 to infinity, Bj, psi Jk, Ej of Tx, where Ej is an orthonormal basis in L2 in exactly this space, which I will denote by E. This is my control space. And bj are non-zero numbers. I can assume that they are positive, such that the sum of bj squared is finite, so that the noise uh, is regular. And psi, j, j, uh, psi jk are random variables, are independent random variables. With densities, uh, the law of psi jk has a density which is denoted by a rho j of r dr. And this rho j are compactly supported functions, c1 functions on the interval minus 1, 1. Right? So if we assume that, your noise or your control in the right-hand side has a full range and when you consider linearization, you will have a linear equation with a control which has a full range. So there is no problem for verifying controllability of linearization. So the only condition is this one, which is not clear how to do, because your noise is bounded. And even though you have a full range, you are not allowed to leave the support of the noise. Because here it is important to have something, this e to k, e to j should be in the support of the noise. So you cannot leave the support of the noise. And this gives a restriction for our result to, to be applicable for the Navier Stokes. We have to take the following setting. So uh, these conditions ensure that you have a unique stationary measure. So let so this is about condition uh, global controllability. So let's, uh, so this discussion about this one. 
So let mu be the unique stationary measure for one. Well, this we already know that it exists and it is unique. Then it's really easy to prove using the uniqueness that the support of this measure is exactly the domain of attainability, let's say, from zero. Or the closure of the domain of attainability. So you consider all the points in the phase space, which can be reached starting from zero and using controls in the support of eta k, in the law of eta k. Right, so you take the domain of attainability from zero, a time one, time two, time three, and so on. You take the union and you take the closure. Then this is a really not difficult to prove that this is domain of attainability from zero, and this will be exactly our space X. The advantage of taking X in this form is that you can reach from any point to any other point. Right? Because you can reach from any point to zero exactly due to the property Renault was mentioning. You just switch off the noise. Ah, sorry. Uh, in, uh, in this setting, in the form of this one, I have to assume that rho j is positive at zero. Sorry, I forgot about that. Well, in the abstract theorem, we don't need that because we just postulated it. But in this concrete application, we need to make zero accessible from any other point. And this is done by assuming that the density at uh, zero is positive. So we can go from any point to the neighborhood of zero and from neighborhood of zero to any point here. So in this, if we take x to be the domain of attainability from zero, which is the support of mu, then you will have this uh, global controllability for free. So this shows that uh, the result can be applied to Navier-Stokes system, provided that your initial condition is in the support of invariant measure. OK, and the same, the same uh, similar result is true for the compact ginsburg landau equation. Uh, so this is all what I wanted to tell about applications. Now, three open problems. Well, the first one is exactly here. So we know that there is a unique invariant measure. We know that any solution converges to this invariant measure exponentially fast. We know also that if you start a solution from the support of invariant or stationary measure, you have large deviation principle. And what about if you start from somewhere else? You can say that you will end up at a random time, which is final exponential moment, in a, any neighborhood of mu. But you can net, not say that it will hit the, uh, the support of mu. In any neighborhood of the support of mu, but you cannot, there is no guarantee that it, you will hit the support of mu. So it is, uh, it is an open problem to prove the LDP, prove the LDP in the setting of math theorem. Uh, in the setting of the main theorem, for initial data in the complement of x. Let's take deterministic initial data which does not belong to x. My system is defined everywhere. And let's assume that you can reach any neighborhood of mu in exponential time. Still, what all you can prove uh, is the local LDP. Well, I don't want to uh, give definition, but if you really want honest global LDP, this is an open question. Second open problem is the case when you, have, you don't have this, this assumption. So this is one extreme case. You have the other extreme case, 
when x is h and k is e. So your support is everywhere, your phase space is unbounded. Well, there are some partial results uh, uh, with the same authors uh, in nonlinearity in 2018. Well, it is not partial, it is about kick forces. Unbounded, yeah. Unbounded kick forces uh, supported everywhere. But these are kick forces, these are not this uh, multiplicative type, type force. So this is a LDP, LDP in the unbounded case. Well, the challenge is to really formulate a simple result. Well, I, well, I find it simple, at least as far as uh, the hypotheses are concerned. So to formulate something like that in the case when you have unbounded noise, well, of course, you will need some extra condition, like Lyapunov function. But it, is, uh, it would be interesting to, form, uh, to have a, this type of result which can be easily verified, as easy as this one. Roughly speaking, you add Lyapunov function and you have a result. Something like that. And finally, the third problem is related to Sergei's talk, uh, Sergei's mini course. It is LDP, but when you don't have B3 prime, you have only B3. So prove the LDP when CL is replaced. by the following hypothesis. Again, in a bounded setting. For any u in x, there is ku, a subset in k, such that the measure of this ku is equal to 1, and the image of the derivative is dense in H, and this should be true for any U in X. Uh, sorry, it's already there. Such that the image is dense for any eta in, uh, in KU. Okay, so, uh, well, if uh, I I have to say something about the difficulties of this problem. So this is not, uh, I don't even know that this is true or not. Well, this one I believe can be done because you already have something here. You just need to understand what, what exactly is used there in terms of controllability. And finally, this one I believe will be as hard as uh, the problem of exponential mixing in this setting. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention.